going to unravel the layers of faith woven throughout history. Welcome to Faith in History. Muhammad died in 632 AD, and within a hundred years of his death, Muslims were attacking near Paris. It's a fascinating story of how this faith spread, and you won't want to miss it today. Today's question of the day, which will be answered at the end of the program, is how many people in the United States believe in God? Again, how many people in the United States believe in God? Muhammad transitioned from a religious leader to a political leader to a military leader. And he went on 45 different battles between 622 and when he died in 632. That averages about one engagement every six weeks. Well, he led 27 of those battles, and he even used the catapult when he would attack cities, like the city of Al Taif. And when he was told that women and children were in the city, he responded by saying, they are among them. So the women and children got to be killed too. So suicide bombers today say it's okay to kill innocent people to advance Islam because Muhammad killed innocent people when he used the catapults. And so we begin to see the spread of this faith in a rather uh, fast moving mode. That's one of the reasons they uh, was because they had a military advantage. And the advantage was the stirrup. Now the stirrup was invented by the Mongolian nomads over near China. And the nomads had little short horses and they'd tie a rope around the horse and leave two loops hanging for their big toes because they would ride barefoot. Anyway, this invention made its way down to China uh, by the fifth century AD and the Chinese made the loops big enough for your whole foot. And that invention made its way along the China Silk Road and the trade routes to Persia. And the Persians put leather straps and metal bars and made these stirrups so that now you could actually stand in the saddle and put the full power of a galloping horse behind your sword. And so that's where the Muslims got the invention of the stirrup. And the Muslims developed it further by using the scimitar. The scimitar was a curved sword, which was excellent for slashing when you were riding along uh, on a horse. Matter of fact, this uh, swords, these scimitars were made out of Damascus steel. Very light, very sharp. They literally could slice somebody in half while riding at a full gallop. They were the F-16s of the day. This was cutting edge military technology. And they would ride in to a city or a village and terrorize. And so the whole village would quickly submit. And so Muhammad divided the world into two houses, two halves, the house of Islam and the house of war. In Arabic, it's Dar al-Islam and Dar al-Harb, H-A-R-B. And so the whole non-Muslim world is called the house of war. It's in transition to become the house of Islam. Now the word Islam means submission, submission to the will of Allah. And a Muslim is somebody who has submitted. And a faithful Muslim thinks there will be world peace when the whole world has submitted to the will of Allah or in short, become Muslim. So where most people think world peace is where different groups that don't believe the same thing just learn how to get along, a faithful Muslim thinks there will be world peace when there's world Islam, when the whole world has submitted to the will of Allah. Now a moderate Muslim thinks the world will submit to Allah in the distant future, maybe at the end of the world. And since it's so far off, just go ahead and get along with everybody right now. The fundamental Muslim thinks the world will submit to Allah now, and they want to help make it happen. And so it's sort of like a manifest destiny. See, in America, everybody in the country sort of knew deep in their hearts that we would go from sea to shining sea. We didn't know how, we didn't know when, but we just figured it would happen, and it did. Well, in Islam, they have a manifest destiny where they think eventually the world will submit to Allah. They just don't know when. The moderate ones think it's going to happen in the distant future, and the fundamental ones think it's going to happen now. But things are beginning to get confused. Because when the moderate Muslim sees America, which according to the USA Today of September 25th, 2008, the USA Today said America was 
nearly 80% Christian and about 2% Jewish and a 1% Muslim and a half percent Hindu and a half percent Buddhist and um, uh, just a fraction of other percentages, a 1% atheist. But when the moderate Muslim sees an 80% Christian country have itself bend over backwards to tolerate Islam, they begin to rethink. In other words, when they see Nancy Pelosi, who's the highest member of the U.S. Congress, and they see her go over to Syria and put on the Muslim veil, the hijab, when the moderate Muslim sees that there is a very popular presidential candidate named Hussein, and Hussein was the first blood descendant of Muhammad. He was the son of Ali, and Ali was the founder of the Shiites. Uh, just a little explanation here. The, the Sunnis come from Muhammad's father-in-law, Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr was the father of Aisha. Aisha was Muhammad's favorite wife. She was six years old when they wed, nine years old when they consummated it. And uh, Aisha was his favorite wife when some of the other wives felt like they were overweight and didn't want to go into the, the bedroom. Muhammad had a different night with each wife. Uh, they would send in Aisha. So Aisha's father is Abu Bakr, and he's the founder of the Sunnis. 90% of Muslims are Sunnis. 10% uh, of Muslims are Shiites, or Shi'ali, which is the party of Ali. And so Ali was the nephew and uh, son-in-law of Muhammad. And so 10% of Muslims are Shiite, and they mostly live in Iran. And so the Sunni-Shia conflict has been a disagreement between the followers of the father-in-law and the son-in-law from the very beginning. Anyway, um, as we look through the uh, trend, as we look through the spread of Islam, and the role that uh, fighting took place in it. So Muhammad divided the world into these two halves, the house of Islam and the house of war. And when the moderate Muslim sees the United States have a popular presidential candidate named after Ali's son or Muhammad's grandson, Hussein, when the moderate Muslim sees that our president and I sort of understand why he's doing it, but I'm not sure he's getting the right advice. But he's the first president to mention the Quran in an inaugural address. First president to take off his shoes and visit a mosque. First president to invite 50 Muslims to the White House to bow their heads toward Mecca to celebrate Ramadan. The first president to have an Islamic postage stamp issued during his administration. The first president to have a Muslim be the U.S. ambassador to the United Nations. Zalmay Khalazad, he took John Bolton's place. And he's the first president to actually force Israel to give up some of their land with Condoleezza Rice and giving up the Gaza Strip and also trying to pressure them to give up sole sovereignty of Jerusalem. So the question is, what's the moderate Muslim to think? When they see this 80% Christian, if you had the 2%, 80%, 82% Judeo-Christian country, doing all this stuff to help advance Islam. The moderate Muslim begins to change and say, wait a second, maybe the world is going to submit to Allah, not in the distant future. Maybe it's happening right before my eyes. And so they transition from being the moderate future Muslims to the fundamental now Muslims, which is the violent one. So in other words, the more the West bends over backwards, thinking that if they can just be a little more tolerant of Islam, they'll reciprocate and become nice. They see the West bending over backwards and they think submission. They think that the world is submitting to Allah, not in the future, it's happening now, and they get very excited. A good analogy is for centuries, Christians and Jews taught that the verses in the Old Testament about Israel being regathered together again, it was taught those were figurative, or maybe they'd happen at the end of the world. And then, lo and behold, in 1948, it happened, and there's Israel. And what happened in Jewish and Christian circles? A tremendous amount of enthusiasm that maybe these Old Testament verses are coming true. That's the excitement that's being felt in Islam right now whenever they see Harvard shut down its gymnasium so they can have Sharia gym practice. Or when Detroit installs Muslim footbaths in their airports. 
or when New York has a Muslim school paid for at taxpayer expense. In other words, they're getting very excited, sort of like a sports team. If your city's sports team uh, is losing season after season, you still are one of their fans, but you're not a very excited fan. You're, you're a passive fan. But if your team begins to win, and they win game after game, and they're winning the, the sectionals and the districts, and they're heading toward the playoffs, you transition to become an enthusiastic fan. You buy the tickets to the game. You put the jersey on out in public. You're not ashamed of them anymore. And if you're in uh, some of those states, the guys will paint their bodies and put cheese on their head. In other words, as they perceive their team winning, they get radicalized. So as Islam perceives itself advancing, there's a tremendous amount of excitement where they move from the future camp, thinking the world will submit to Allah in the future, they begin to move into the now camp. So in other words, the, the foreign policy that's been taking place is actually encouraging more violence rather than subduing it. And so this is a very important uh, issue, especially when we look at the history. So Muhammad uh, fought in these battles, and then his followers fought in the battles. One of the comparisons that people find interesting is to compare Jesus and Muhammad. Jesus never killed anybody. Muhammad killed an estimated 3,000 people, including cutting off the heads of 700 Jews in Medina. Jesus never led armies. Muhammad led armies. Jesus never owned slaves. Muhammad got a fifth of the slaves taken in battle. Um, Jesus never married. Muhammad had anywhere from 11 to 22 wives. There's a verse in the Quran that says, uh, Allah has given you the slave girls for your booty. Another verse said, married women are forbidden unto you except those taken in battle. So you can have four wives, but you can have as many concubines as you can afford or, or take in battle. And so when you see the differences there, now, if you point that out to a faithful Muslim, they won't deny it. They'll just say David was a prophet, yet he killed people, led armies, owned slaves, and had lots of wives. And of course, my response is, yeah, but Jesus didn't. <laughs> and besides, look at it a little bit closer. The Jews just wanted their little plot of geography, Israel. There's no command for the Jews to subdue the world to Yahweh. And if you look a little closer, the Jewish law is an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. In other words, the punishment fits the crime. This has been the standard of common law in Western civilization. But Islamic law says to cut off the hand of a thief. In other words, the punishment is a whole lot more than the crime. In Jewish law, if you rape a woman, you, uh, you have to marry her. But in Islamic law, if you rape a woman, she gets whipped a hundred times because she was a tool of Satan's attempt you. And she dr must have dressed provocatively, and so therefore she's guilty of tempting you, and she gets whipped a hundred times. And so there's not the same basic fundamental backgrounds between the Jewish law and the Islamic law. But if you look at it a little bit further, Jesus taught that God was our father. Muhammad said it's blasphemy to call Allah your father. Uh, Jesus taught that we're all God's children. Muhammad said Allah took no wife and has no children, has no child. Um, Jesus taught that we're to have a personal relationship with God. Uh, well, Muhammad said it's blasphemy to even want to have a personal relationship with Allah because he is transcendent and unknowable. Jesus never forced anybody to believe in him. There was one story where he said something difficult and many disciples walked with him no more and he turned to the apostles and he said, will you guys go too? And Peter said, well, Lord, where else can we go? You're the only one with the words of eternal life. But Jesus was willing to let them go. Muhammad said in Hadith al-Bukhari, volume 9, whoever changes his Islamic religion, kill him. So you're free to become a Muslim, but you're not free to leave. But Jesus was willing to let him go. So we can begin to see some differences. Jesus taught to forgive trespasses. That's what we say in the Our Father. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Muhammad taught to avenge trespasses. When he finally conquered Mecca in 630 AD, he went in there and he only ordered 10 people to be murdered. Uh, one of them was a man named Ibn Qatal, who had two slave girls that he had them recite poems making fun of Muhammad. 
and Muhammad ordered the two slave girls to be murdered too. So here it was to avenge. When your honor is trespassed against, you avenge it to maintain your honor. That's why today there are things called honor killings, where if a man's daughter embarrasses the family by dating a non-Muslim, the family will kill their own daughter in order to gain the honor back. So we begin to see there's quite a difference in these worldviews. And since one is becoming more aggressive, it behooves us to study and see this comparison, which we'll do in a little bit. Hold on. Most of world's history, power was in the hands of kings and pharaohs and sultans. America did something unique with power in the hands of the people. But are we moving back in the direction of a king? Well, in the book, Change to Chains, we see the 6,000-year quest for control and where we fit in the picture, a fascinating book that you will want to get. To receive your copy of Change to Chains, send your love gift of $25 or more to the address on the screen. The Time Life Company has the Great Ages of Man series of books, and here's one on early Islam. There's a picture in there of artwork of an African being sold as a slave. Matter of fact, slavery was one of the chief ways that Islam was financed. So many Africans were captured that the Muslim Arabic word for slave is the same word for African. Abid, A-B-D. So they only had one word for African and slave. We're going to look at this fascinating history that definitely affected the world. America fought a terrible civil war to end slavery. It was Abraham Lincoln that issued the Emancipation Proclamation. He was the first Republican president in the 1856 Republican platform. It said it was to eliminate the twin relics of barbarism, slavery and polygamy. Well, it just so happens that Islam allows polygamy and slavery. Where we ended slavery in America in 1865, slavery continued in Saudi Arabia until the 1960s and in Yemen in the 1980s. And indeed, the human rights organizations show that slavery still continues in Niger and in Mauritania and several African countries. Well, if you look at history, over 180 million Africans were taken captive by the Muslims and taken throughout the Ottoman Empire. Uh, slavery, when you do conquest to get areas, um, you will get booty, but you also get captives, and those captives are sold into slavery. And there are over 40 different words for slave, female slave, child slave, escaped slave, because slavery was an integral part of their culture. Well, the, uh, even the 1001 Arabian Nights has the story there of slavery uh, of the different eunuchs. A eunuch was an African male slave that uh, was, had his organs cut off. And um, uh, so they would work in the harems and take care of the wives. Many sultans had a thousand wives. And uh, this goes back to the pattern that Muhammad uh, set when he would conquer cities, like the Jewish city of Kaibar. In 627, uh, Kaibar, the Muslims fled from the ones that were driven out of Medina, they fled north about 100 miles to Kaibar. And when Muhammad attacked Kaibar and conquered it, uh, the chief, Jewish chief, chief was named Kiana. And the Jewish chief would not tell where the tribe's treasure was hidden. And so Muhammad had him stretched out and they kindled a fire on his chest till he was almost expired. And then Muhammad uh, gave him to one of his warriors who beheaded him. And so uh, this is uh, the torture that took place. But then they would confiscate uh, the, the Jews and the treasure. And, and that's one of the key ways in which the faith spread. Well, 180 Africans were taken slaves, 10% of them were sold to European slave traders and brought to the New World. 
Every slave that was brought to the New World was purchased from a Muslim slave trader. The Europeans were afraid to go into the uh, African continent because of the dangers and the wild animals and, and mosquitoes and so forth. So they bought the slaves from the Muslim slave traders. Now slavery is wrong and it's terrible. And it's always been wrong and it's always been terrible and Jesus never owned slaves. And uh, one of the reasons that slavery ended in America was because they were trying to apply the Christian teaching of do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Well, many of them died crossing the Atlantic Ocean as the slaves were brought to the New World. Only 500,000, about a half a percent, were taken to North America. So it gives you an idea of the huge percentage that were taken captive. It was one of the almost, uh, and it's still going on today in, in Sudan and those different countries. So we see that they had used this free labor to help expand the Islamic Empire. And they not only captured the slaves from Africa, but over a million Europeans were taken slave from the 1500s up through the uh, 1800s. And uh, one of the people that was taken captive after the Battle of Lepanto was named Miguel de Cervantes. And he was ransomed back. There were entire Catholic orders in Europe called the Maruthans or Trinitarians. And the head of their order was called the Ransomer. And they would collect alms from across Europe and then use the money to ransom back their relatives who were in the dungeons of Algiers and Tunis and Tripoli. And uh, they would look in the, the caves and, and prisons and try to find them. And then, or they might be galley slaves. And so Miguel de Cervantes was ransomed, went back to Spain, became a writer. And he wrote the famous Man of La Mancha with Don Quixote, one of the very first novels. Anyway, we'll, we're going to get into that more in some of the future programs, but did you know one of the pilgrim ships was captured by the Muslims? That's right. They founded Plymouth, Massachusetts in 1620, and in 1625, a pilgrim ship filled full of beaver skins and dried fish was headed back to England, and it was captured in the English Channel. And William Bradford writes that the crew was taken on to Morocco and sold into slavery. And so you see that this Muslim sultan in Morocco, Moulay Ismail, had 25,000 European slaves work as artisans, and they built in this huge palace. It's uh, nicknamed the Versailles of Morocco. And Moulay Ismail had over 500 mostly European wives that bore him 1,042 children. So we see uh, a very interesting culture that had been taking place at the exact same time the pilgrims were founding their little settlement on this American continent. We're going to look at some more of this because this is one of the cultures that's currently growing and expanding at a phenomenal rate and it does hold impact for us. So stay tuned and we'll cover some more of this fascinating information. Now, here's the answer to the question of the day. How many people in the United States believe in God? A 2003 Harris poll reported 90% of Americans believe in God. A 2007 Gallup poll reported 9 in 10 Americans believe in God. A 2007 Newsweek poll reported 91% of Americans believe in God. A 2004 Fox News poll reported 92% of Americans believe in God. The USA Today, February 25, 2008, published results of the Pew Forum's U.S. Religious Landscape Survey that reported only 1.6% of Americans are atheist. President Dwight Eisenhower stated February 20, 1955, quote, Without God, there could be no American form of government, nor an American way of life. Recognition of the Supreme Being is the first, the most basic expression of Americanism. Unquote. This has been a fascinating study on the spread of Islam and how Muhammad went from a religious leader to a political leader to a military leader. And within just five years of coming into Medina, there were no Jews left in Medina. And so we see the tendency to grow in a way that the other cultures no longer exist after Islam becomes introduced. And so we see that none of the apostles led armies. 
every one of the caliphs led armies. The first 300 years of Christianity, there were 10 major persecutions and Christians were thrown to the lions. They never once led an armed resistance. The first 300 years of Islam, they conquered Arabia, North Africa, the Holy Land, Persia, Spain, southern France, and they were within 170 miles of Paris. They went from the tents of Arabia to Paris in just 100 years, and it was mostly through military conquest. The Quran wasn't even written down for most of that time, and nobody in Europe even spoke Arabic. And so it was all through a way of spreading their faith, using the scimitar sword and the stirrup. Well, we also looked at the role that slavery played, because when you do conquest, you not only kill those that fight you, but you do take booty and you get slaves. And so we've seen that uh, 180 million Africans were taken into slavery by Islam. And only 10% of them were sold to European slave traders and brought to the New World. The ones that were there in Africa died crossing the Sahara Desert or had been mutilated, uh, became eunuchs, uh, worked in harems. Just a very sad struggle in existence. But we see that as it grows, civilization begins to spread in other directions and eventually spread to Western Europe and then from there um, spread to America. We're going to continue to look at this study. Why? Because it has application for us today. And why is the Lord allowing this to happen? Well, maybe to bring us to repentance. We'll talk about that a little bit more. Thank you for joining me. This has been a TCT Network exclusive production. If you would like to see more exclusive special programs, send your support to TCT, PO Box 1010, Marion, Illinois, 62959.